The Gospel reading for today comes from the 15th chapter of Luke, the opening verses. And you will recognize these verses and the parables that they offer us. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I love this story of the lost sheep, and I hear immediately echoes of Psalm 23, a favorite for so many of us. And I love the way that it so often gets expressed in music. For music has a way of slipping deeper than any words and going right to our hearts. And in fact, one of my favorites that lifts up the image of 23rd Psalm and Jesus as our shepherd is good old number 273 in Voices United, the King of Love. It takes an ancient Irish melody, St. Columba, and then offers this image of hope. The king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. This was the hymn that my mother asked that we sing at her memorial service last April. And in fact, it was the hymn that was sung at my grandmother's funeral service some 30 years before that time. I wasn't sure about inviting us to sing it today because I thought "Mm, I might burst into tears. So I had some quiet time before and sort of dealt with that. But it was a song that in those final days of my mother's life when we were in the hospital, it was a song that I actually sang to her at her bedside. And we held hands, and we sang, and there were tears. And as I was singing, or more in the time and the space after, as I looked at this 85-year-old woman, so small, in a big hospital bed, white sheets everywhere, tubes coming this way and that, I thought, she's lost. She's lost in all this space and this time, coming right to the edge of her ending. And I thought, Her son, me, I'm feeling pretty lost as well. We're both people of faith. We know a good, long, rich life. The timing is good. All is well. And yet at the same time, probably like all of us, when you come to your mortality, when you come to the end, not sure what happens after, when you're thinking of your whole life, there is that sense of being lost. We all have those moments. And not just when someone is dying, ourselves or someone we love, but so many times in our life when we feel caught up in a wildness, we're in free fall, we don't know which way to turn, there's no direction, no foundation, something has gone wrong, and we are directionless and we are lost. That's what these parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, that's what they're talking about. And note that the parables aren't really talking about sin. They're talking about being lost. 
The sin word comes in, but it comes in at the beginning and is used by the religious folk, the folk who attended synagogue or temple or, dare I say, church. We righteous folk who sometimes wield the sin word as if it were a weapon so we could decide who's in and who's out and who's bad and who's good and who's better and who's best. And usually the ones that are most comfortable using the word are the ones who are pretty sure that they aren't the sinners and you are, and you're out, and you're bad. And Jesus actually said, lost. It's the lost that I'm talking about. Even Luke, the gospel writer who framed these parables, wasn't totally confident in trusting the story, and so tagged on what I think is almost a little moral conclusion. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Well, When you stop and think about the parable, we're talking about a sheep and a coin. Not much sense of a sheep repenting, a a coin repenting for some sin. It just doesn't make sense. And I think Jesus deliberately started us with these stories. I actually found myself imagining how a sheep might get lost. I saw one small little gambling lamb who could care less for any rule or restriction, saw a patch of green, a splash of sunshine, went round the corner, heard the shepherd's call, decided to ignore life is too much fun, oblivious. Sometimes that's how we get lost. Or I imagined a sheep falling asleep. Or one that was perhaps shunned by the rest of the herd and was off by itself and felt lonely and wasn't sure whether it was welcome to rejoin. Lost. And then I think of the coin. And the coin is lost because of the circumstances beyond its control. The coin just slipped off the headdress or the hands of the woman who was then so alarmed. Nothing the coin did wrong. So often there are circumstances in our lives that are beyond our control that end up leaving us feeling lost. Just talk to any one of two million people in Syria. Not their choice, not their decision, but boy, I bet that they would say, we're feeling lost now in a land ripped apart by war. I've talked to so many people in my years of parish ministry, and over and over I hear these stories of being lost, lost at moments of dying and of death, but perhaps feeling one's child is lost, a a mother struggling with an illness that sends a child into all kinds of crazy directions. Your heart aches, you're not sure what to do. Or I've met people for whom work is the structure that holds them together, and then accident or downturn in economy, pink slip, or even retirement, and you're, you're just not, you're not sure. Or when life just feels like it's a complete muddle, you wake up at the midpoint in your journey and you think, what, what does this all mean? I, I've lost my way. Almost like a child who, who finds himself or herself abandoned and not sure how to go forward. Lost. Lost. That's what Jesus was talking about. And you can feel the poignancy, the, the pathos. It's not a condemnation. It's not a scold. It's a recognition that to be human so often means that we end up feeling lost. Like my mother in the hospital bed. We spent a week together, 12 days actually, and I was there as her son and grieving and supporting, but I couldn't help but sometimes moving into my ministerial role. She had great ministers, Keith and Gay, who were there and present, who knew her, but nevertheless, there were times that I couldn't help but move into a consoling role. And I would shoot off into scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. And then I'd flip into Romans 8 and saying, I am certain, absolutely certain that there is nothing in all creation that can ever separate us from the love of God. And then there would come this moment, and I remember it so clearly when I said to my mom, you do trust that God is with you, don't you? And this to my mother, who has probably never missed a Sunday's church service in her life, and if she has, I can't remember it. And she looked at me in total honesty and said, well, I trust in God, but I'm not exactly sure who or what I'm trusting in. And I thought, isn't that the way? 
We, we have a faith, we have our trust, and yet so often we're, we're not sure. We, we use the God word, but what do we really mean by that? So often it feels like we're trying to package God. Three little letters, you pop God into your pocket or pull him out of the Bible, and, and there it is. And my mom was saying, I trust, but there's also this floating question, which means that I'm, I'm lost. And yet, below that, there was a sense of being held by I know not what. You might say God appears perhaps as some presence. You can't quite see it. It's more like a feeling that you're being held. Or it may be more like a love that will not let me go, that you can just feel within your body somehow as your heart pumps and beats. Or you might be like the poet Francis Thompson and say, it's like the hound of heaven. I'm being pursued. There is something that just will not give up. Maybe it's like a, a beam of light, like a lighthouse, and the beam keeps cutting through the darkness or the fog or the gloom and illuminating just that patch of beach where you find yourself lost, not sure where to go, and yet the light is there. Or maybe it's the flashlight that comes through in the dark and you say, ah, there it is, and you point yourself in the direction of someone who's actually looking for you. Or maybe it just feels, well, almost like a, a gravity or a, a, a magnetic force that just pulls you. And you say, I'm, I'm being drawn into something, drawn even perhaps into death. Jesus, I think, was trying to help people with that, saying, God, well, and as a good Jew, he wouldn't even say God. He would avoid the word Yahweh, the name of God, which means I am who I am, which is basically to say we don't really know who or what we're trusting. We just hold on to it. He said, let me tell you a story. It's like a shepherd. It's like a crazy shepherd who is determined to find every single sheep, parks the 99 in some enclosure or out in the wilderness, and in a wild fit of enthusiasm goes off and will not give up until he finds that one little sheep. Or it's like the woman with her broom. And what an image for God, a woman from a lower social stratum with her broom, searching and searching, Reminds me, one of my daughters once lost a precious little tooth. It had fallen out. We were dreaming of the tooth fairy and the reward that would come in the middle of the night, and suddenly the tooth is gone. And I'm thinking, how am I ever going to find it? How am I getting this kid to sleep? Broom! And I brought out the broom, started sweeping all around the floor into a little dustbin, and there in the midst of all the dust was the tooth. I tell you, there was rejoicing. Jesus said, it's sort of like that. Ordinary, down to earth concrete ways of believing and trusting in something, someone, some force, some love that is searching for you. We turn also to some of our most familiar metaphors. We talk about this God as being like mother and father, which is so deep in our hearts, trusting when we're little that, in fact, no matter how lost we are, mom and dad, they won't give up until we're found, embraced, and brought safely home. You may not know shepherds and sheep, but you know mums and dads and kids. You as child, you as parent. It could also be the lover who says, for better and for worse, I am there, and I will always be there for you. Could be a friend, a, a sponsor, if you are in a 12-step program, who says, night or day, 2 a.m., I'm there for you. I will find you. You can go on such a tear, but it won't go beyond my love. We offer up so many images, stories, metaphors, and we who follow in the way of Jesus often say, in fact, the best example of that love is Jesus himself, someone with skin, someone with flesh, right there in the body, with stories of a man who says, to tax collectors, to prostitutes, to workers, to blue collar, to all the lost, rich or poor, come. And who doesn't say just come, but make sure that he goes to them and is not at all worried about sitting down and sharing a meal with them and saying, everyone is welcome at the table, and the table is not complete until everyone is there. Because you see, the why of the searching is because each one of us is absolutely precious, absolutely loved by God. 
There's nothing we have to do, nothing we have to prove. We are simply lost and beloved. It's almost as if the Holy One were weaving some vast tapestry, a wonderful, incredible creation that involves every strand of the cosmos. And each one of us has a particular gift our own uniqueness, specificity, and particularity. And that's what God is hungry for, craving for, wants to be in relationship with, and takes that thread, that lost thread, and weaves it in for the tapestry will not be complete until each and every thread is found and woven into the new creation. That's why God is searching for us. We're lost and we trust in a searcher. And the good news is we will be found. And being found is the essence of the story. They say that there is joy over one sinner who repents. But you know, I've come to believe that repentance happens after you're found. It's not the condition that precedes it. You say, oh, I'm really sorry, and then you're found and welcomed home. It works the other way. You are found, you are accepted, loved and embraced and brought home. And then in your heart is such a sense of joy and delight and wonder that in fact your life changes. That's when you repent as a response to love not as the precondition. Repentance has a funny feel in the English language. It carries connotations of contrition and remorse, like you want to almost whip yourself and I'm so awful. In the Greek, metanoia, it's much more about a, a turnaround, the 180 degree reversal, moving in a new direction, actually living your life differently, dare I say it, adopting and embracing a whole new lifestyle. So you are lost, the searcher pursues you, you are found, you are loved, and you are changed. And now, suddenly, you live differently, and there is joy. Because that's where the parable ends. Not so much with joy up in heaven, probably there too, but more importantly, joy down here on earth. Both the shepherd and the woman say, I have found that which is lost. Let's have a party. Rejoice with me. The floating question, really though, is will the others rejoice? Will you rejoice? Will we in the United Church party away? Sometimes we seem so work-oriented. I want to suggest that we need a few more parties. Even when, as a denomination, we sometimes beat our breast and say, we're feeling lost, and we're not sure who or what we should believe in, this is the invitation through parable to trust that there is someone, something, a love we do not understand, that is searching for us, that will hold us as an individual and as a community. And we will be found, and when that happens, we need a great party, a great party. Thanks be to God. Amen.